The Mindset of Successful Thinking. You deserve the very most out of life. Written by me, Troy Smith, and I'm here to deliver this message to you via audio. Dedication. This book is dedicated to my family, to my lovely wife, Adrian. You have always believed in my vision of being a world changer and doing so without complaining, but always encouraging me with love in your heart every step of the way. Your love is unmeasurable, and for that I am forever grateful and thankful that God loves me enough to bless me with my soulmate, allowing me to know you and fall in love with you every day of our lives. To my two adorable and awesome children, Sir Duke and Duchess Kaya, my hope is for you both to know that all that I do in life is to make you both proud to be my children. To my mother, Suzette, I want you to know that I am who I am because of you. You have never given up on me, and you have always been my number one fan since day one. And all I want to do is continue to make you proud. Lastly, this book is dedicated to you, the reader. And I hope you are truly impacted by what is written on the pages of this book, because you deserve the very most of life. By you taking the time to read this page shows that you are hungry for change and desire to be successful in life. Message to the reader. Why most? Why should you read this book? Why should you read another book discussing how to be what is so-called successful? Why should you read yet another motivational book that's going to tell you something you may already know? Maybe this is your first motivational book teaching you about success. Even if it is, what is going to be different in this book than any other book that may cover the same subject? You may have been asking yourself these very same questions when you picked up this book, flipping through the pages and reading a paragraph or two, trying to determine if this book is worth your time and money. I truly understand how it feels wanting to know more about your topic of choice, but not knowing which book would actually deliver on its title or what the content states it will reveal. We are in an era of information overload. Simply by swiping your finger on your smartphone or even speaking to your cell phone, you can find information about any subject known to man. The truth of the matter is, the information in this book more than likely may be information you already know. The same information you previously received can be relayed through a different messenger said differently, read differently, and therefore allowing you to receive the message differently and relate to the message and the messenger with a deeper level of understanding than before. We all have read the motivational books given 100 steps to making you tons of money in order to become a true success. However, what you will discover as you read this book is that success is not always gauged by how much money you have in your bank account. There is more to success than the many processes taught on how to get to the success status. So here's the great news. In this book, you will discover the true secret to success. If you are ready to experience success in your life, you will start to notice what the secret to success is as you continue to read the pages here in this book. The secret will be discussed throughout the book, but unless you are ready to receive the secret to success, you will indeed miss it totally. Mindset of Successful Thinking, a.k.a. Most, is the perfect book that will uncover the principles of how to become successful in life. We will be discussing four pillars and uncover how personal success derives from these four pillars. Appearance and self-awareness slash confidence, education, building relationships and networking, and strategic life planning. If you learn how to implement these four pillars into your life, success is bound to happen. This book will allow you to see success from a different viewpoint and to understand its true meaning from a different perspective and a different thought process. Most importantly, this book will give you the tools to discover what success means to you on a personal level, helping you to understand the secret to becoming successful. This book has been written for you, the reader to receive the message within these pages and allow the message to guide you on your journey to success. This book has also been written for you to engage after every chapter by taking notes and answering three thought-provoking questions. In the notes section after every chapter, take a moment to reflect on the stories told, the message within the story, and the revelations you have received. 
write your notes on each chapter and how you believe the chapter relates to your life and how you can apply the principles taught in your life now as you strive for your own success. This will give you an opportunity to reference your thoughts or key points to remember at a later date that may help you with the personal situation or guidance needed on your journey to success. I look forward to meeting you in person and discussing your thoughts on what you have read and received from this book and how this book has helped you on your personal journey to success. I also look forward to discussing what you may have written in your notes. Always remember, you deserve the very most out of life. I hope you enjoy the book. Remember this quote, the true outcome of having a mindset of successful thinking is having an unwavering expectation of successfully achieving a predetermined goal, knowing that the outcome is supposed to happen. Introduction. In the month of July, in the year of 2010, I arrived in Nashville, Tennessee, to interview for a new banking position with a growing financial institution in the area. I was staying with some friends of mine from college. They were a newlywed couple. To prepare for a full day of interviewing, At the time of the interview, I entered with confidence as usual with the expectation of getting a job as a personal banker. It was a lateral move for me in regard to positioning at the previous bank, and it would also require me to move my family, just my wife and I. It wasn't like we were moving the Brady Bunch or anything, just being honest. However, it was a position paying almost double my current salary at a competing financial institution, which made the offer more appealing. Picture this. I was being interviewed by a panel of three. I was so confident in the interview that when the regional manager, soon to be my boss, asked me the most rhetorical question that any interviewer would ask the interviewee, I know I had to respond in a confident manner. He asked me, so you think you're the man for the job? Are you a producer of getting business? My response to him after taking a quick look at my resume and point to a particular spot was, sir, Do me a favor and read this right here and please read it out loud and tell me what that says, top producer. Now, many of you may say, okay, you may have taken it too far with that one. Maybe you were a little too confident. I would say to you, you may be right, but there is a time and a place for everything. As I analyze the situation, the ending of my interview was a time for me to be aggressive. Yes, even in an interview. When you work in sales over time, you learn the demeanor of people. You also learn what gets people going. What got the regional manager's attention was an individual with confidence. With that being said, I received a call a couple of days later and was offered a position. After a full day of interviewing with different branch and regional managers at several locations, I returned to the home of my college friend where I was staying. The wife of the couple asked me a question that I have been asked many times before, but in a different way. This time, hearing her ask the same question in her words, I actually stopped and thought for a moment. She asked me, how do you do it? Being the big guy and all, you're always confident about yourself. When you go to an interview or want something, you get it. How do you do it? I paused, thinking for a moment before saying, I don't know. I just believe if it's for me, it is for me. And if I want it, I believe I can go get it. So the ultimate question is, where does this confidence come from? It's not like I'm the next Morris chestnut with the body of a Greek god from the movie 300. I'm just an average big guy, handsome as ever though, that carries his weight and dress well as a distinguished gentleman should. Why should I be confident about anything when, by society standards, I shouldn't? Instead, I should be in a house eating double cheeseburgers with bacon and a double order of fries with a bowl of ice cream on the side and getting fatter, right? Fortunately, I don't fall into the category of what society say should be my way of life. Maybe the confidence inside comes from taking every negative comment said towards me by other children while growing up in the inner city and turning it into fuel to be and do just the opposite. That negativity really played a role in my mindset of thinking. Maybe that confidence inside 
comes from being the eldest of three boys with a very young mother in a single parent household, living on food stamps and welfare. In my mind, I knew that it had to be something more to live in life. I knew it had to be a better way of living. I craved that something more. Maybe being the only African-American male in certain educational, religious, and career settings played a role in my mindset. Maybe just believing that if God grants me favor in certain situations to achieve certain goals in his timing, played a role in my mindset of thinking positively about my life and the situations I face. I truly believe that each and every one of those situations played a very vital role in my mindset of thinking and gave me the fuel I needed to achieve the goals I set for myself. Each of those situations played a role in creating my mindset of successful thinking. What I discovered is that regardless of your race, nationality, creed, age, religion, or your body type, it's how you view yourself as an individual that determines your mindset and how you start to develop a mindset of successful thinking. I learned very quickly that how I view myself is how others are going to perceive me as an individual. So I made up in my mind that I would not be a follower, but a leader in determining the outcome for my own life. I will create the appropriate atmosphere that I desire for my life. If people liked who I was and what I represented, then they would follow me. If they didn't, then that was their choice, and I was still okay and comfortable being me. As a young lad, I was always bigger than the other kids. I wasn't really fat per se, just bigger in size. Back then, how you looked and how you dressed, including the name brand shoes you wore, played a defining factor in your level of social status in school. I didn't have the most up-to-date shoes at times, and for a long time while attending school, I can remember only having two pair of pants and uh, three shirts to wear. That can really play a number on your mindset and how you see yourself when you think about how you are viewed by others. Growing up during my younger adolescent years, people would call me Big Troy or Fat Troy. Over time, I started to accept the fact that I was fat. Pause for a moment. This is a prime example of what I was talking about earlier regarding how you view yourself as how other people will perceive you to be. For years, I adapted to the fact that I was bigger and fatter than everyone else around me. I accepted that I couldn't do certain things that other people did because I was fat. I couldn't get certain girls because I was fat. During that time, I limited myself because my mindset believed what society said I was, which is sad because as I got older and I look at those pictures, from that time, I noticed I wasn't fat at all. Over the years, I noticed that my confidence evolved from being a little fat boy, seeing myself as being the fat kid with limitations, to the kid who, regardless of what someone would say about my size, started to accept who I was beyond what others thought of me. I started to have more confidence in myself for who I was. My size did not define me, nor who I was or where I was headed in the future. My mindset was no longer stuck on being big or fat. I knew I was more than just my size and what others thought of me. How you view yourself will play an important role while developing your mindset of successful thinking. Growing up in the inner city, there were two well sought after professions in my generational era. The typical career for a young man was thought to be either a professional athlete or to become a rapper. When you think about living in a hood and what the thought process is like of those living there, it can be similar to a bucket of crabs or like living in a trap. So many people don't make it out of the hood because they get caught up in the generational curses and the cycle of the trapped mindset continues. If they do make it out, they are easily sucked back in the same trapped or defeated mentality. The few that do make it out and overcome the defeated mentality do so by changing their mindset. My ultimate dream was to be a millionaire, move my family out of the hood, and buy my mother a huge house. I planned to do all of that, but my plans never included much education to get me there. Although my mother was young, and at the time, she didn't have much of an education past the ninth grade, she always preached the importance of education and how it could be the ticket to a better life for me. It was ironic to me that even though my mother didn't experience having a higher education, 
She was determined that her children would graduate high school and hopefully attend college. At the time, I didn't understand why she pushed us so hard to attend school. But now, I'm so glad she did. Although my mom didn't know how our lives would be different being exposed to a higher education, she did understand that in order for us to be successful, it was a must for us to do something different than what we were already exposed to in the inner city. I always told myself, I'm going to do big things in my life. And my mother saw my passion, believed in me, and always reassured me of my positive thinking. As a very young child, I always broke the number one rule to never talk to strangers. I mean, I would talk to anyone around me, even if it was simply asking them how their day was going. My mother would get so mad at me for talking to strangers, but she always knew, because mamas always know, that it would pay off for me someday. We will get into that more later in the book, in the chapter discussing networking and building relationships. In the pursuit of building a mindset of successful thinking, a healthy and encouraging family or friend support system is vital to growth. I must be honest, it's not an easy task attempting to always be in complete control of your mental state of mind or controlling how you view yourself in a positive or negative manner. I am constantly giving myself a self-evaluation on a daily basis. Believe it or not, at times I battle with encouraging myself with positive thinking continuously. Self-doubt is a part of being human. Research states that one out of three African-American males will go to prison at some point in their lifetime. Furthermore, in 2008, studies showed that African-Americans constituted nearly one million of the 2.3 million incarcerated population. With startling statistics like that, as an African-American, I have to fight the small voice, which is just the devil or the enemy himself casting doubt and fear into my cognitive thinking, reminding me of the plights I am faced with on a constant basis. When you are born and raised in the inner city, when every day is a struggle and blessing at the same time, one can very quickly understand that he or she has two solid decisions to make very early in life. Number one, will I be another statistic, easily following the road most traveled, ending up in jail? Or number two, will I be the individual to take the road less traveled and impact the world with positive influence? I chose the latter of the two. However, I have countless individuals that I know personally that can't say they follow the road less traveled. The trap mentality consumed their mindset. Of course, you may say, come on, tell me something new. You'll be right to make such a comment. If you were to ask one out of two African-American males about their life story, I guarantee that the stories would correlate in some way. But what makes every individual story unique is the decisions that they made after noticing the challenges that were ahead in their life. After finding out what decisions the African-American men who made it out of the trap mindset decided to make, rather from the inner city or from the suburbs, you find that he ultimately decided to view himself differently from what society's expectations of him were. For that simple reason is why I choose to have a mindset of successful thinking at all times. My motto on life is very simple. Go big or go home. What do I have to lose? When you have a positive mindset, why accept being just another ordinary individual? With a positive mindset, you can live a better life and at the same time impact the society you live in on a constant basis, day in, and day out. In this book, I'm going to be explaining why it is important to have a mindset of successful thinking. I will be sharing my knowledge how a mindset of successful thinking has gotten me to this point in my life and where this successful thinking mindset will lead me. I will be sharing stories that impacted my right now while discussing the challenges I have faced as a black man in America, as well as a big and tall male stunning society with the confidence I possess. This book is broken into four simple sections that I believe is what helped me throughout my professional career. Each section is built on the four principles I live by that has played a role in developing my mindset of successful thinking. The four principles are appearance and self-awareness slash confidence, education, building relationships and networking, and strategic life planning. While reading each section, 
I would like for you to take your time and comprehend the message within the text. Reading the title of the section, you may think the title means one thing, but as you read the text, you will find that there is a deeper message and more thought-provoking meaning that will lead you to thinking outside the box and more so in tune with how successful people think. For instance, the section regarding education. At first glance, someone could easily think it may be simply discussing the importance of getting an education, attending a credible educational institution, or maybe even explaining the importance of education. However, this section discusses more than the importance of how getting an education can set you up for success. This section discusses the education of learning oneself. If you don't understand who you are and educate yourself on what makes you tick as an individual, what your passion and your dreams are, you could be setting yourself up for failure. Not knowing who you are can inhibit you from developing the mindset of successful thinking. Glad you've added this book to your reading, and I hope you get something from the content that can help you on your journey to your success. Chapter 1. What is success? Before we can start developing our minds to think more successfully, we must truly understand the term success. Success is attaining a favorable or desired outcome for your life or situation. However, we often define success by wealth. Over the years, I've come to the realization that the meaning of success is all relative to the individual and oftentimes success for many people does not include money. I procrastinated and made all type of excuses as to why this book wasn't completed before I actually published it, of course. And for this simple reason, I am glad I was not finished writing just yet. Over the course of eight years, I have been able to mature in certain areas of my life that allow me to gain a better understanding of certain aspects of life. Success being one of those things. I've always associated success with money and the material things that money can buy. Man, I was wrong. Like the meaning of the word, success is attaining a favorable or desired outcome of a certain task. Well, that means that if you plan to be a doctor, teacher, lawyer, preacher, sanitation worker, biologist, or bum, and you attain what you plan to be, you have gained success. Even if the end goal is something considered to be bad, if you attain your goal, you attain success. We often depend on society to define the meaning of certain things, including what success should be. This way of thinking, I believe, is wrong, but it is a reality for so many. When you experience success, you should experience fulfillment, not stress, once success is attained. How many people do we know and see in the news or on social media that may have achieved success in the eyes of the world but that same individual is miserable and depressed. That individual is not experiencing success by any stretch of the imagination. So in order to truly start building a mindset of successful thinking, you have to understand what you consider to be success. I understand that I don't have to be filthy rich to be successfully satisfied if I am not going to be fulfilled at the end of the day. What changed my entire outlook on what I thought success was to me was the birth of my children, Duke and Kaya. After the birth of my daughter, I started to really evaluate my life and see the bigger picture. Things that I thought were important to me about being successful really started to fade away. For example, having an Audi car, an Audi A8, was once a symbol of success to me before having children. After my children were born, I started trying to figure out how to get rid of the same vehicle to save on expenses. The car no longer defined my success. Now that I am starting to gain a better understanding of what success looks like to me, I can now relate to those co-workers that would tell me how money doesn't matter to them when I am trying to run a sales contest. I learned that some individuals actually just want to serve others through their gifts and talents, and when they are able to do just that, they feel successful. So it is imperative you start to really think of those things that bring you fulfillment and satisfaction in life. Being fulfilled in your life by what you do and how you impact others is considered being successful. 
Since money is oftentimes what we consider to be the benchmark for success, let's dissect the topic a bit. Ask yourself this question. How do you feel when you finally receive a certain amount of money that you thought was a lot? How did you feel when you purchased that special gift with that large bonus you were dying to buy yourself? Do you feel fulfilled? Do you tell yourself, I need more? Did you ask yourself, is this it? For me personally, after I met a certain financial goal, I hardly even felt satisfied. I often felt disgusted after the initial high was over. I would often tell myself, Troy, you're from the hood. You've never been able to experience this side of the tracks. So why not ball out? But after all of that, I thought was balling out. I received the first notice of payment due to whatever it was I decided to purchase with my balling out down payment and reality always seemed to find me. Whenever I achieved a financial goal, I always said, I need more. And oftentimes, it wasn't because I needed money for personal fulfillment. It was because I needed to pay off some newly created bills due to making more money. Until one day, when I was sitting at my desk, staring at the computer screen before cold calling a client, fully disappointed in myself saying, this is not it, and I am not living my purpose at all. Don't get me wrong, I like my job, and at times I truly appreciated what I did for a living. But there is nothing worse than feeling unfulfilled and dissatisfied with your life. It's like a gut-wrenching, stomach-cramping, sickening feeling that comes over you, and you start to tell yourself something has to change. I listen to a lot of motivational tapes while I work out in the mornings, and one of my personal favorites is Errol Nightingale. One of my favorite quotes from Errol Nightingale is, the true way to happiness is doing something you love to do while at the same time benefiting others. To take it a step further, Tony Robbins said, if you are benefiting or helping others, success will follow. I heard that same quote time and time again, but it was now starting to really sink into my mind and into my heart more so than it had ever done previously hearing the same exact quote. Same message, different time, and I received it in a different manner than before. For a very long time, I believed in a pipe dream thinking that success was all relative to how much money an individual had in the bank. Believing that some people were successful due to what he or she had to materialistically show. Little did I know, most of those individuals were probably miserable, disgusting, and climbing a mountain of debt like I was doing. Don't get me wrong, I'm all about making a ton of money and plan to be very wealthy in my lifetime. But money started to not be the main factor that defines success for me as society declared it should be. I concur with something I heard Les Brown say in one of his old speeches about having his MBA, which stands for having a mega bank account. However, I plan to attain the same MBA by doing something I truly enjoy, something that is fulfilling for me. Over the years, I heard successful entrepreneurs say, don't chase the money. The money will follow you if you are doing something you love and enjoy. When I started on the quest of retraining my mind in the way I see success, that saying started to really sink into my subconscious mind, and I understood what was meant by those words. In order for us to start thinking successfully in our life, we must discover our true north, discover our purpose. For me, I realized that I get pure joy from speaking positive words of encouragement to others and changing the way that people see their outlook on life. Encouraging and inspiring people is something I do on a daily basis without being paid. With that being said, the more I spoke into people's lives, I discovered I truly have a passion to do public speaking. Speaking to people one-on-one -on -one and positively influencing their mindset was a great feeling. But I wanted to be able to have the same influence on a greater scale by speaking to a room full of people about the importance of having a mindset of successful thinking. When I figured out what I considered to be personal success for me, I started to develop my mindset to think more positive on a broader scale in the area of becoming a successful public speaker. I encourage you to think about your dreams and your great ideas that you continue to push further into your memory bank. Think about the jobs you thought you would have when you grew up. Ask yourself, are you doing what you thought you would be doing now? If you are, then great. But are you successful? 
Remember, success is relative to the person. But if you have fulfillment for the sake of what we are calling success, then I would consider you successful. But if your answer is no, then you will have a challenging task trying to renew your mind to think more successfully if you're doing something that is not bringing you fulfillment. Being comfortable with where you are for the sake of surviving is a mindset trap. In order to get to your success level, you first have to change your mindset and want to achieve that level of success, even if it means stepping away from your comfort zones. Here are a few steps to help you discover what success means to you. Think about the things that really bring you joy. Notice I mentioned what brings you joy, not happiness. Happiness can be considered a state of mind, and it can be changed at any time due to certain circumstances. But joy could be experienced without any effort. For example, if you're in a grocery store line and you see a little baby smiling at you, you may experience a bit of joy due to the innocence of the smiling baby. Think about that special something you would do for free. I know you have heard this before, but it's so true. If you are doing something that brings you joy and there is no pressure to do it, you would more than likely do it for free. I know it sounds cliche, but it is a true fact. Think of that one thing you actually like doing. So we know if you are doing something that brings you joy, you would do for free. Think for a moment what it is you love to do. Discover that one thing you actually like doing. Once you figure that out, you're on your way to having a successful life. When you discover what brings you joy, what that something is you would do for free, that's something you enjoy doing, you are definitely on your way to becoming a successful individual. If you noticed, each of the above steps mentioned the word think. And that alone shows that everything starts in the mind before anything is expressed in the physical. In order to be successful in life, you must first figure out what success means to you and then mentally develop a mindset of successful thinking. Now that we know this important factor, we can complete this awesome book with confidence. Chapter 2, Time. Time is the true currency. When you hear the saying, time management, what is the very first thing that comes to mind? Take a moment and truly think about that saying, time management. We hear it so much at the workplace or at leadership seminars. Well, what exactly is time management? Oftentimes, when we think of time management, we think about being on time for work, being prepared and on time for meetings and making time for the gym or something similar. But I truly believe time management should be viewed as more than just being on time to a certain place. To me, the meaning of time management is being a good steward of your time. I believe that time is the true currency. And it is just as important as, if not more important than money. Let's take it a step further. If you don't set aside enough time dedicated to accomplishing goals, goals that you need to accomplish to make a certain amount of money, guess what? You don't get the money at the end because you didn't have time to accomplish the goals. As human beings, we may not begin at the same starting point financially. Some people come from wealth and are often born with an upper hand, money being available from the start. Others may start at a very humble beginning, having nothing but their name. For example, real estate mogul and billionaire entrepreneur Donald Trump. His story to wealth states that he was able to borrow over $1 million from his father to start his own business. Many would agree that what his father did for him was a great start for Trump to become a wealthy entrepreneur. However, that of course is not the case for the majority of us. There is one thing that we all share regardless of where we come from, how much money our families have, or what our race or sex may be. Time. Regardless of how much money anyone has, we all share the same amount of time. Everyone is given the same 24 hours of time daily. How we use that time is up to each individual. No one can give you more time than the 24 hours everyone is allotted daily. This is why I believe that time is the true currency rather than money, and why it's important for each of us to become better stewards of our time. When renewing and training your mind to think successful, 
time management will be a critical component in the process to becoming successful. Remember, we discovered that success doesn't always correlate to an abundance of money, but instead, success relates to every individual separately. Over the years while writing this book, I noticed that all the material I read, in addition to countless videos and seminars by some of the wealthiest individuals known to man, each person maximized the use of their time efficiently. It is important to know what the most valuable use of your time on a daily basis should be. You need to know how you are planning to spend your currency of time so that you maximize every moment that you can't get back. Have you ever planned to start your day at the sound of your alarm clock in the morning, but after hitting the snooze button six times, you notice you are now running late? What's the next thing you tell yourself? Do it sound something like, man, now my day is starting behind schedule. When you are finally starting your day, realizing you slept for a good seven hours, you are now left with 17 hours remaining in your 24-hour day. Now it's time for work, and a typical work day is at least eight hours for a full-time job. You are now left with nine hours out of your 24-hour time allotment. No less, no more. One thing about extremely successful individuals is that they can tell you to the very second what every hour of their day is allotted to. They plan every moment with the intent to efficiently maximize the use of their time. For example, in John C. Maxwell's book, How Successful People Think, he states that at the beginning of every month, I spend half a day working on my calendar for the next 40 days. 40 days work for me rather than just 30. That way, I get a jump on the next month and don't get surprised. By the time I'm done, I can tell you nearly everything I'll be doing almost hour by hour during the coming weeks. I chose to point out the above reference for the simple reason of showing you the mindset of someone that is considered to be successful. He is a very successful and esteemed best-selling author, and his time is his primary focus in order for him to be successful in life. In order to be successful in whatever field you may decide to give all your energy to, you must first understand that your most valuable currency at your disposal is your time. It's entirely up to you how you spend it. So it's time we stop using the age-old excuse of not having enough time to complete a certain task. Start being honest with yourself and understand that time is not holding you back. Ask yourself a few questions to analyze what the real issues are that hold you back from your success. How are you spending your currency of time? Let's be completely honest here. We always find time for the things we value most. So what is it that you value the most? What will you decide to spend your time doing, even if that thing was the reason for you running out of your 24-hour daily amount of time? Do your dreams of being successful matter? If so, why are you continuously wasting your time? Your time matters. It is valuable, and it waits for no one, nor do it return back to you if wasted. Use it wisely. Every moment counts. Chapter 3, Appearance. While attending Tennessee State University in pursuit of my undergraduate degree, I had a professor my sophomore year by the name of Miss Parham, who taught African American literature. She later became like a mother figure to me while attending college. One day I decided to stop by her office to discuss my midterm grade, and on that day I decided to challenge the judgment of her grading system. I explained to her how I thought that I deserved a better grade than what I received. Unfortunately, I was not successful in my attempt to convince her to give me a better grade. Instead, I was challenged by Ms. Parham, as well as given a very in-depth explanation of how I earned the less than desirable midterm grade I received in her class for the fall semester. She challenged me on how I viewed myself as an adult and as a professional student. She explained that if I actually applied myself and took education more seriously, I could actually be successful, not only in her class, but in life. I always knew I would be successful, but I never knew how I would get there. So in my best Gary Coleman voice, I said, what you talking about, Miss Parham? And she proceeded to go down a list of things I could do better, like getting to class on time, turning assignments in on time, and truly preparing for class presentations, although I was good at winging them. However, there was one comment that she said to me that stuck out the most. She said, you should consider changing the way you talk beginning with enunciating your words. 
My reply to her was, you want me to start sounding white? She responded with a laugh and said, what and when did speaking clearly and speaking educated start becoming a white thing? I proceeded to explain why being educated was considered being a white boy where I was from. Of course, that was a very warped way of viewing being an educated individual. The reason for that brief story was to show you how your mindset and the way others view you truly play an important role in your pursuit of successful thinking. While attending college, I was heavily involved in college campus ministry work, so much involved that people thought I was a full-time pastor. I was driving all over Nashville, Tennessee, being a high school football chaplain, college athlete chaplain, and leading different Bible studies on campus. While on campus, my life was very busy outside of getting my degree. One summer afternoon, one of the actual campus pastors that was over the missionaries wanted to have a one-on-one meeting with me in the church office. To say the least, I was a little skeptical about this meeting because it was like having a meeting in the principal's office in high school. Nevertheless, that was actually what it was, a visit to the principal's office. The meeting with the campus pastor started out as encouraging, but quickly began to take a turn for the worse. I was being criticized about how I was doing certain things as a campus leader. The pastor started his criticism of me with the word champ. This simple word was the beginning of any conversation with any pastor at this particular church. The enunciation was often stretched out like champ. This conversation that followed was never good. However, what the pastor was about to say changed my life forever. Although it made me angry at the time, it truly blessed me in the end. He told me, champ, as a leader, you have to start looking like a leader and start taking your appearance seriously. Once again, in my best Gary Coleman voice, I said, what you talking about, Rail? I explained to him how I dress doesn't matter as long as I am winning souls for Christ. He told me that if I didn't start looking like a leader, I may have to stop working with the ministry. He told me to really think about our discussion if I wanted to stay around. I mean, he didn't say those exact words, but that's how I heard him. I left that meeting very disappointed. And to be honest, I was really pissed off after our conversation. At that time, I started really considering my options and how I was going to leave that particular ministry. But for some reason, as time passed that day, I started looking at the conversation we had during the meeting from a different point of view. I had to realize that he was not the first person to say something about me carrying myself as a professional. That same day, I had to go to work, still bothered by the conversation I had with the pastor. And I remember speaking with my co-worker and good friend, Arvid Caldwell, who was basically my brother about my meeting. I mentioned how I was tired of people thinking that someone had to dress up to be a good leader. But at that moment, something happened. I started to think about the possibility of changing to see if the way I dress would make a difference in my leadership. So I decided from that day on, I would accept the challenge to dress as a leader and began to dress up as much as possible. What's funny about that situation is that the pastor was right. And I had to admit it. Things started to change when I started presenting myself as a leader by the way I dressed. Things started to get better for me. What I discovered is that there is a time and place for everything in life. Like it states in the New King James Version of the Bible, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, and reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. After looking back on that situation, I began to take a self-evaluation of my appearance. And what I discovered is that I truly dressed like an athlete and sometimes worse. My dress code was t-shirts, sweatpants, and house shoes. No, literally, I wore Walmart corduroy house shoes, a.k.a. Debo's, everywhere I went. No, really, everywhere. And by worse, I mean the t-shirts at times would have cut-off sleeves as well as the sweatpants that I wore as shorts. I was so confident in who I was, but at the same time, so unaware of how I was presenting myself. I would be on the front row ministering to new members with this attire. Nothing about what I wore said I was a professional. At times, I would wonder why people did not come to me while down front during benediction. I was ready and available to help change lives. I don't believe that the pastor knows how much he changed my life that day by simply challenging me to understand the importance of how I carry myself as a professional. That day, the pastor may have just been doing what someone asked him to do by bringing the way I dressed to my attention. But if he didn't follow through with the task, I may not be where I am today. 
But more importantly, I had to make the decision to change regardless if it was out of anger or willingly. I needed to make that decision to change to help build my future success. I had a choice to take that advice given and turn it into anger and do nothing or turn it into something positive and become a better me. Your self-awareness and appearance are indeed critical in the development of your mentality and getting to a mindset of successful thinking. Take a moment to do your own self-evaluation and think about areas in your life that could use some improvement. Chapter four, allow yourself to make mistakes. There is an age-old question that I believe everyone should ask themselves when faced with a difficult challenge or an opportunity. And that question is, how would you ever know if you never try? That is a question I often ask myself if I am struggling with a certain decision. My mother used to say to me as a youngster, Troy, you're so hard-headed. I don't know why you have to learn things the hard way. And she shakes her head after giving me a good old-fashioned whooping. Sadly, I have to admit she was right. I was a very bad child growing up between the ages three to six. Not bad like running the streets, bad in the sense of disobeying instruction. I don't know why I needed to learn things the hard way before I got to a point where I understood why I could not do something or that something just wasn't for me. I guess it was the curiosity in me that intrigued me, leading me to make certain decisions. Whatever the case, I owe a lot of my success today to my childhood stubbornness and not just accepting things as was. Of course, a successful mindset can certainly have its pros and cons. For example, I can recall a time when I was around four to six years old. I would leave my yard to go on miniature adventures around the neighborhood. While on my adventurous journey, I would get lost and an adult would always help me find my way home. I would ask anyone for help that would talk to me. Of course, when I returned home to a very frantic mother, I would receive a good old-fashioned whooping. But I was so stubborn that I would do the exact same thing the very next day. I guess I was testing my limitations and learning boundaries of what was accepted by my mother at that time. Or maybe it was simply that I enjoyed challenging authority. However, over time, as I got older, I started to recruit a couple of friends that would either ride bikes or walk along with me as I went on these adventures around the neighborhood. My mother basically gave up on the whole staying in the yard deal and worked with me to find a common ground by giving me a specific time to return to the yard. If I look at this same situation from a working point of view, I experienced my very first promotion from upper management at a very young age. My mother, the upper management, promoted me from a curious adventurer with limitations to allow me to expand my territory, allowing me to leave the yard. She also noticed that I followed through with meeting deadlines on time returning to the yard at a certain hour. And she noticed my ability to recruit new talent to help grow my business. I always had friends with me on my adventures. Now that is how you work the system. You may ask, what does that childhood story have to do with anything about this chapter? Well, well that story has a lot to do with this particular chapter. Allowing yourself to make mistakes so that you can grow and learn from them. It's funny how the simplest experience, or in this case, the simplest story could change your entire perspective on a certain idea. Did I not have my own plans and ambitions of adventuring and exploring new things? Was I not faced with opposition that could have derailed me from my plans of meeting my goal of leaving the yard? But the ultimate question is, how would I have known my limitations or if I was capable of meeting my goal if I never tried or if allowed fear to hold me back? If you look at the above story for what it represents and not just a kid trying to explore his curious mind, you can relate with similar stories of your own. As adults, we often allow opportunities to slip away due to fear of simply trying, regardless of the mistakes that could be made and the lessons that would be learned. It's funny how a simple childhood story can correlate to real adult challenges. I'm sure that we all can think about that one individual we know, even if that person is you, that has tried every path imaginable known to man to become a success story, but failed while attempting. But what sets that individual apart from the rest of the world is that he or she tried. There's another old saying that states, there are two types of people in the world, the ones that make it happen and the ones that watch it happen. I ask myself questions all the time. Which type of person am I? 
I would like to think I am the person that makes it happen and not the person that watch others make it happen, although I've played both roles. There comes a time in life where you just have to believe in yourself and just go for it, whatever that it is for you, without reservations and make it happen. Who cares if you make mistakes on the way? Those mistakes make you wiser and stronger as you also become more experienced in your pursuit to a success story. There is a passage in the New King James Version Bible in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 2 through 8, that I live by that states, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Regardless if you are a spiritual believer or not, there are universal laws that exist that if you don't have the faith to believe that you can be successful in whatever you do, you will not attempt to do the one thing that will allow you to be successful. And that is try. Furthermore, you have to realize there will be challenges along the way and mistakes will be made. But all you have to do is try and believe that what is for you is for you. If you try and believe that you can, then you will successfully achieve any goal you set for yourself. Sometimes it's easy for us as adults to weigh something off because it seems too simple to do. We often believe it takes much more sacrifice and hard work to become successful or to be a successful-minded individual. But what people truly need to understand is that it is just that simple. We just need to condition our minds to believe that we can be successful and simply try whatever it is that we are passionate about. You will soon realize that the only reason certain individuals are more successful or wealthier than others in the world is because that individual just happened to try without worrying about the mistakes that could be made along the way. Research has shown at times it's not that the wealthiest individual in the room is the smartest man or woman in the room. It's just that he or she decided to just do what everyone else is not doing. Try. As a music lover, I've heard songs on the radio that I would question. Why in the world is this song so popular? I started thinking about the music artists I knew personally that were 10 times better than the guy on the radio wondering why their songs are not being played. To me, some of the individuals I heard on the radio don't even have lyrical content in certain songs whatsoever. Even without the lyrical content, their songs were being played. But why? Although I'm not a fan of certain popular music, I decided to do some research on some of the artists and I started listening to their interviews on the internet. I must say, I was blown away from the artist's mindset of successful thinking. Some of the artists had similar stories to stardom. Some had stories of people telling them that they would never make it in the music industry. However, for some reason, the music artist decided to try to make it in the music industry anyway. After looking at their interviews, I started to think about the music artists I knew that were much better than the popular artists on the radio. I started thinking about certain conversations we had in the past. I started to recall the excuses and the negative thinking that they had when trying to pursue their music career. I remember how they would overthink things to the point that they never made any progress at all. There was a reason why the popular artist's music was on the radio and my friend's music was still on the shelf. The popular artist decided to be a success regardless of what others thought and regardless of how many times they would fail, they kept on trying. There comes a time when we must be honest with ourselves and ask the question, what type of person am I going to be? Am I going to be the person that makes things happen? Or am I going to be the person that's going to watch things happen? I think it would be safe to assume that you are not the individual that chooses to sit and watch things happen. Instead, I believe that you are the person that is going to make things happen in your life. If not, you would not be reading this book. Your dreams that you envision your success to be like are yours and meant to become your reality. Chapter 5, The Importance of Educating Yourself I had a former co-worker, Stephen, that I considered to be one of the most intelligent individuals I know. It didn't matter what subject was being discussed. He would know all about it, engaging in conversations with his knowledge. 
It didn't matter if it was about sports, the philosophy of quantum physics, or Marvel comic books. It seemed like he knew everything. He would often say, I just know a little about a lot of stuff. Although we often joked about him being a genius, I truly believe he is a genius. And I would often encourage him to get tested to confirm that very belief. One day I was observing Stephen while in between appointments and noticed him looking at Wikipedia. I asked him, what are you reading? I can't remember exactly what he was reading at the time, but I believe he was reading the history of World War II. Now don't get me wrong, this guy wasn't a slacker on the job. In fact, he was one of the top producers for the region. But in between meeting with clients, he would always take a moment to educate himself on different subjects. I started noticing he was literally doing this on a daily basis, studying whatever he desired to study, like he was casually studying for a test. I can recall one morning, Stephen and another co-worker, also by the name of Stephen, maybe it's a genius gene with people by the name of Stephen, were giving each other a U.S. history lesson, and they were literally grading each other on right and wrong answers. They appeared to literally be upset when they had given the wrong answer. Since they were having so much fun, I decided to join them in the discussion. Let's just say U.S. history wasn't my strongest subject that day. I say all that to say, in order to continuously develop your mindset for successful thinking, you must develop the habit of educating yourself on a daily basis. At this time, I am not talking about educating within the traditional school setting. However, I am speaking in regard to non-school setting or in general studying on your own. In Brian Scherer's book, what rich people know and desperately want to keep a secret. He mentions, become rich in learning and in experience, and then all the other riches will follow. As I continue researching how the mindset affects one becoming successful, I discovered that as an individual aspiring to become successful, you will need to possess the desire to want to learn and really expand your mind to learn multiple subjects. As an African-American male, I heard the phrase, if you want to hide anything from a black man, put it in a book on multiple occasions. As I think about it now, sadly, I would laugh with friends about this saying when I was a younger lad. But as I became wiser, striving to become more successful, that saying wasn't so funny to me any longer. It's very disturbing how children in our society depict being educated as being uncool. It's even more disturbing to think about how I bought into that same lie. I recall times when I would call someone a nerd that studied hard, made good grades, and actually turned in his or her homework. Or times I may have called a friend of mine that was African descent a white boy because he actually cared about excelling in his studies as if only white people needed to succeed. Now that I am older and much wiser, I truly wish I could get those years back to better position myself as a successful individual. But as we discussed in the beginning of this book, time is non-refundable. Wasted time is simply wasted. However, I wouldn't change any of my past because everything I experienced has played a part in developing me as the strong leader I am today. Let's take a quick look at some successful individuals that understood the importance of educating themselves to develop the mindset of becoming successful. Booker T. Washington created his own university. Frederick Douglass, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, all men who understood how educating their minds would lead them to their success. What about that individual you may know personally that was always studying, had their nose in the book, and now you see them living a successful life? Education is tied to success. If you educate your mind, you start the process of changing your mindset to think more successful. That individual who desired to become successful understood the importance of educating themselves. Successful individuals never stop learning, and they are continuously educating themselves to develop a stronger mindset of successful thinking. Think about your talents, the things you desire to know more about. Start with learning more about your interests, and from there, expand your mind to learn more about other things that the old you would have never thought to learn about. The more you educate yourself, the more you know, and with more knowledge, you start to develop a successful mindset. Chapter six, pick up a book. Become rich in learning and in experiences, and then all the other riches will follow. Ron Share.
The author of one of my favorite books, The Magic of Thinking Big by David J. Schwartz, wrote, Many people in their attempts to build a successful life forget there are tools to help them. You have not forgotten. You have then the two basic qualities needed to realize real profit from this book. A desire for greater success and the intelligence to select a tool to help you realize that desire. As I've mentioned before, I often heard the saying, if you want to hide anything from black folk, just put it in a book. Regardless of how erroneous or ugly that statement may be, it does have some truth to it. That is, of course, if an individual decides to be ignorant, as well as oblivious to learning at all. I believe I have some jurisdiction in this area of discussion because at one point in my life, I was one of those individuals choosing to be oblivious to learning. An individual that would not pick up a book unless it had some types of assignment attached to it. Even then, I would only read enough of a chapter to pass the test. Growing up as a child in the inner city, you are encouraged by peers not to be caught reading or learning more than what was required for school. And if you were, you were often teased for being a nerd or trying to be white. This is the same thing I mentioned in the previous chapter about my discussion with my college professor, Ms. Parham, when she posed the question, when did become educated become a white thing? Although reading was often encouraged by teachers as well as encouraged through supplemental reading programs in school, it seemed that there wasn't any incentive to gaining more knowledge by reading outside of school. But where did this type of chosen ideology of ignorance come from? Who decided to spread such a cancerous lie throughout the youth of the African-American community? What's so cool in not gaining knowledge by utilizing books that are available everywhere to build a successful mindset regardless of genre? Well, we can point fingers in many directions as to who is to blame. And if you read the book, Miseducation of the Negro by Carter G. Woodson, many educated African-Americans believe the finger could point in one direction. Regardless who's to blame and regardless of race, it's to the benefit of the individual to gain the knowledge that is available to everyone. It is up to each person to want to put in effort to read a book, study something new on their own, and not just because it was a sign. Remember, education is a lifetime process, and it is not only achieved in a traditional classroom setting. As you discover what it takes to develop a mindset of successful thinking, as you discover what it takes to develop a mindset of successful thinking, you will quickly learn that reading and gathering helpful information that come from books, rather traditional with pages or electronic, will need to become your new norm. Books are full of useful information that could be used as guidance to successfully achieving your goals and becoming a successful individual. Most of all, when you are reading pertinent information written by authors in your chosen field of expertise, you will start to discover that you are not in it alone, and there are other individuals that think the same way you do. You also learn that there are others that are just as passionate as you are about a certain subject, and with the knowledge you learn from others, you are much closer to achieving your ultimate goal to become successful. For example, I always told myself, I'm not a self-help slash motivational book reading type of guy, but man was I wrong. After reading books like Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie, Grow Rich, Success in Business, Success in Life by Randall Baskin, just to name a few, I learned that there were individuals out there in the world that think just like me. When you start to realize the necessary tools needed to expand your mind, you will start to develop more building blocks to help you strengthen your master plan. There is another old saying that says, why recreate the will? Which has some truth behind it. Why create the will when you can just make something already proven better or develop a much faster strategy creating a more successful game plan? Like the chapter in this book that mentions the importance of educating yourself. Educating yourself outside of the traditional classroom is very important to the development of your mindset of successful thinking, and it starts with a book. My first book I ever read from cover to cover, page by page, was Anointed for Business by Ed Savoso. I read this book the summer after my college graduation. You may ask, your first book you ever read in its entirety was after you finished college? 
I will have to answer with a little embarrassment. Yes. While attending school from grade school to college, I would always do just enough to pass. I guess that was the mindset of an athlete. Tell me what grade I need to make to stay eligible to play the game, and I would make sure I stay above that line. Or it could have been I was just freaking lazy. So in a nutshell, I would read just enough to get by. However, I'm so glad that way of thinking changed over the years. After graduating with my Bachelor of Science degree, I was like most college graduates, oblivious to the future ahead. I was in need of guidance to choose a career path. I battled with the idea of going into full-time ministry or working in corporate America. I had a very difficult decision to make, and I was really in need of some help. I didn't truly believe I was called to do ministry in the settings of the traditional church. I really believed that I was called to do ministry of the marketplace as a businessman. So my roommate at the time, Reggie Robinson, who was a great drummer, by the way, encouraged me to read the book Anointed for Business. And that book changed my life forever. Learning that there was someone else in the world that was faced with the same dilemma as I was an eye-opener. The book went into great detail about how the author faced growing up in the church, wanted to meet the expectation of those around him, like his parents, etc. But he wanted and needed to choose the best career suitable for him, a career where he could be most effective and satisfied with his decision. By learning and understanding Ed's story, I was given very important tools to discover how I could move forward in developing my master plan for my life and my future. There are studies that show reading for pleasure builds wealth, but more importantly, reading helps develop the mind while on the pursuit of developing a mindset of successful thinking. As I mentioned in previous chapters, success is relevant to the individual because success to some people may be becoming a kindergarten teacher and to others running a Fortune 500 company. Having tons of money and purchasing a yacht may not be a very successful lifestyle for certain people. But regardless of how individuals define success, we must understand that success must start in the mind first. As Earl Nightingale would say, the key to every human being's success is in his mind, the gold mine. While in the pursuit of achieving a mindset of successful thinking, be sure to pick up a book to help strengthen your mind on your journey to successful thinking. Chapter 7, Building Relationships As you develop a mindset of successful thinking, you must realize a golden rule to being successful is recognizing that everyone is important, that everyone matters. After reading the book, The Magic of Thinking Big by David Schwartz, what he mentions in chapter 9 stood out as a very important detail about success. Success depends on the support of other people. The hurdle between you and what you want to be is the support of others. I want to ask you a simple question regarding the above passage. What key words stick out to you? It's okay if you need a couple of minutes to read it again and think about your answer. I want you to read the passage slowly and really ponder your answer. The key words I was looking for are the support of other people. In order to be a successful leader or simply a successful individual in life, you will need to understand the importance of not doing it alone and that you cannot get to your ultimate destination in life by yourself. You will need the help of certain individuals in order to receive your piece of the success pie. Ponder for a moment on the great leaders that have great supporting cast around him or her that help them to become a successful leader. This list could be subjective, but for the sake of making a point, Steve Jobs could not build the great technology powerhouse without Steve Wozniak. Martin Luther King Jr. could not have begun to tear down the walls of racial barriers without the support of civil rights supporters and leaders like Ralph David Abernathy. The legendary basketball player Michael Jordan could not have won as many world championships without Scottie Pippen, B.J. Armstrong, Dennis Rodman, Horace Grant, Steve Kerr, John Paxson, and the rest of the Bulls team. The list can go on and on, but the point is to build relationships and know that you cannot get to your level of desired success by yourself. It is very important to understand that everyone has a role to play in building a great team and helping those that desire to get to the top Get there successfully. When you are building any business, you must understand you are a brand and you must build that brand successfully. In order to maximize your brand potential, 
You must understand that building a solid team is very important to you becoming a successful individual and having a successful brand. You must realize that every person you come in contact with throughout your life is and will be a very important person that could possibly play a very vital role in your future, helping you to develop the mindset of successful thinking. In sales, you will learn that in order to be a successful producer, you must treat all customers the same, regardless if you believe that he or she has or does not have money. As long as you live, always try to remember one thing. Just because someone looks like they have money doesn't mean that he or she does have money. Oftentimes, when the individual that looks like he or she is broke, they will be the individuals that are loaded with money. Throughout my banking career, I've seen bankers and salesmen and women miss out on great paying deals because they were chasing the wrong client. They were showing more favoritism to the client that betrayed by their appearance to have money. I understand that it can be difficult at times not to chase what looks like money. I've had to check myself as well when I noticed I too was showing favoritism to certain clients. That is why I decided that everyone I encountered is important to me. Even if it was a client wearing rags for clothing or if it was a client in a three-piece suit, we will never know for certain who will play that next critical role in our life that will aid us in getting to the next level of success. Success is in the numbers. My understanding the importance of building strong relationships with like-minded people. And as these relationships start to evolve, you will start to see more opportunities that will start to be presented. While reading this book, How Successful People Think by John C. Maxwell, I started to notice that successful people tend to understand the importance of working in numbers in order to truly experience success. John states in his book, good thinkers, especially those who are also good leaders, understand the power of shared thinking. They know that when they value the thoughts and ideas of others, they receive the compounding results of shared thinking and accomplish more than they ever could on their own. We live in a truly fast-paced world. To function at its current rate of speed, we cannot take on the journey alone. That reminds me of a previous employer I sold big and tall clothing while attending graduate school. The big and tall shop was a small mom and pop's clothing store with three locations. The store, believe it or not, was considered to be a successful high-end big and tall retail store, although it only had three locations. One day, my manager was giving me a lesson on how pricing works, as well as teaching me the process of purchasing product at the trade shows in Las Vegas. He was sharing some great information on how the store was able to get the top brands at the same price that the much larger big and tall shops were getting. Remember, we only had three locations. That is when I learned about buying groups. A buying group is basically made up of a number of small companies that decided to pool their money together in order to have more purchasing power to purchase product from the manufacturers at the same price as larger companies. This is a great example of what John C. Maxwell was explaining when he talked about experiencing shared thought in order to experience greater results rather than someone going at something alone. When you are a small company dealing with manufacturers, you want to get the best price when ordering product in bulk. And the more you buy, the cheaper each item. The less you buy while ordering in bulk, the more expensive the product. This also ties back to the importance of building healthy relationships. If the owners never noticed the importance of building strong partnerships with other like-minded business owners, they could not compete with the larger companies in growing market share. Opportunities come through building relationships with strangers. Let's take things to a more personal level with building healthy relationships. I remember the time I was working at a particular financial institution in South Haven, Mississippi. During my lunch break, I decided to take a trip to the bank I utilized for my personal banking needs. People that know me know that I never meet a stranger and I don't mind talking to anyone. So on this particular day, I noticed a young man sitting in the lobby And he was dressed like he was waiting to be interviewed for a job at the bank. I found out later that he was indeed interviewing for a job. I started talking to him and ended up giving him a little encouragement because he seemed a bit nervous. I felt like I needed to say something to him. A few weeks went by and I stopped by the bank again to take care of some personal business and spotted a familiar face sitting at the desk. Yep, 
the young guy I met who was interviewing for the job. I later found out his name was Thomas. And from that moment on, we developed a business relationship. In the coming months, I wanted to make a move in financial institutions and seeing as I now have a relationship with Thomas, who worked at another banking institution, he was able to set some things in motion for me. I know it seems elementary, but it's true. If you want to go places in life and not be ordinary, you have to build relationships with people. You would never know who will play an important part in your next career opportunity. However, that is just one example of how building relationships with other like-minded individuals has paid off in my life. Success is in the numbers. And the more you build strong relationships with others that understand the importance of moving forward, the more successful you will become. As we stated in the beginning of this book, success is all relative to the person. And you must know what success means to you. One thing we do know for an absolute fact is that success must first be achieved in the mind and that we must first have a mindset of successful thinking before success is shown by action. Chapter 8. It's not all about you. While you are building strong business relationships and understanding the important philosophy of getting the support of others to successfully achieve your personal goals, it's also imperative that you understand the old saying, it's not all about you. I know you may say, well, Troy, isn't that one of the sayings that goes without saying? I will say both sayings are very similar, but very different. For example, take a look at the very end of the sentence where it states, understanding the important philosophy of getting the support of others to successfully achieve your personal goals. The key word in that sentence is your. What often happens while an individual is in pursuit of successfully achieving his or her own personal goals, he or she forgets the support system that got them to the promised land. This is why it is imperative to understand the old saying is not all about you. Take the NBA star LeBron James, for example, and this is not to take a shot at LeBron James personally because I don't know him personally. We can all agree that he is probably the greatest player in the NBA at the moment, and he is often compared to past great players. It is often said that LeBron James is the best player that has ever lived. Even several NBA players and analysts have said the same thing. However, LeBron James began to do the one thing that all successful leaders should never do in order to avoid a hard fall from grace. He started to believe his own hype. During an interview after a game during the 2015 Finals, King James, as he is often called, started to talk about how he is the greatest player on the planet. He actually mentioned it in the previous interview how he couldn't be stopped or slowed down due to him being the greatest player of all times. People love to glorify you and put you on the pedestal. But when you start to talk about your pedestal and take pride in your own gifts and abilities, you start to lose the support of your following. This is a great example of how an individual can forget about the support system that got them to the promised land. This is what is meant by it's not all about you. We all should realize and understand that when we get to the top, there's always someone or a lot of someone who helped you make it to the top. And it's never all about us. Now, I must admit, I had trouble with this way of thinking in the past. But I work hard daily trying to avoid thinking it's all about me. What I learned over my 30 plus years of existence here on this earth is that the more successful you become, the more selfless you will need to be. I read countless wealth-based books and discovered that the wealthiest individuals are the most given individuals. Now, there could be a few different reasons why wealthy individuals share their wealth. Reasons like giving to get a tax break or show off how much money he or she has or simply because of social status peer pressure. I know it's hard to believe, but the wealthy also experience peer pressure to give toward worthy causes because their wealthy friends are giving. Finally, giving because he or she has so much to give when going broke is never a concern. One of those reasons could be why successful individuals are the most giving. But I also started to notice that majority of the most successful slash wealthiest individuals give because they sincerely care. If you read the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki, you will learn that while in the process of becoming rich, 
You would need to make it a priority to make interest in all income classes. You can't just become successful and forget that the middle class and lower income class exists. Forgetting would be a selfish act, but not forgetting because you know you did not get where you are alone is a true example of understanding it's not all about you. Growing up without the finer things in life, you could easily start to establish a very resentful attitude toward the well-to-do individuals of the world. There are so many reasons why someone could develop an envious attitude that can carry over into adulthood when they have seen the wealth but never had access to the things that the wealthy could buy. Their attitude can stem from how they were raised and seeing how successful people carry themselves, how they speak, how they live their life. What begins to happen is that you begin to slip into the battle of the haves and the have-not war. As you start to educate yourself on how to become a successful-minded individual, You start to understand that those individuals that are considered to be the haves became successful by changing their mindset. They're not smarter than you or anyone else by any means. They just decided to become successful. When you change your mindset, you change your life. Earl Nightingale says it best. We are all self-made, but only the successful are willing to admit it. It's very interesting how we like to blame others for our own shortcomings and laziness but don't want to admit our own fault to becoming a self-made and non-successful individual. Remember, earlier in the book, we discovered that the meaning of success is all relative to the individual. You may consider yourself successful because you are doing what you love to do as a fifth grade teacher, and that is great. But for the sake of this chapter, we are defining success in regard to an individual's financial status. I wanted to give you clear examples how getting the support of other people helps you on your journey to success and why it is never all about you when your mindset changes to think successfully. So while you are in the process of gaining the mindset of successful thinking, think about those who helped you along the way. Even if it was just words of encouragement, a ride to a very important meeting. It all serves a purpose as you are in pursuit to becoming successful. I want to share a story about an individual that truly understands the philosophy of how it's not all about them. This individual is Randall Baskin. I was fortunate to meet Randall through a very special mutual friend of ours named Rob Simbeck. Now, Rob is an individual that truly lives by and understands that it's not all about me viewpoint. Rob helped our friend Randall write his book. After reading Randall's book, I was truly inspired to give. Reading his story how he financially gave so much to different causes and even gave to total strangers, people that he had never even met, made me want to give as well. What's even more interesting about this story is that his book is not intended to encourage people to give. It mentions the importance of giving, but that is not the objective of the book. The objective of the book is to inspire people to act on their dreams, explore their ideas, and how to grow rich in the process. However, He committed to paying a $700,000 bond note to cover the university's expenses on an annual basis, I believe. And that same day after committing to seeing someone else's dreams come to pass, his investment banker called to inform him that his account had been increased by $700,000. This is a true example of reaping what you sow. And when you sow into fertile ground, your fruit returns are plentiful. Zig Ziglar says, the more you help others achieve their goals, you will also achieve your own goals. I am a true believer that when you sincerely help other individuals get to where they are trying to go, you will get to your own destination much faster and people will be more than willing to become an ambassador for you and what you represent. My good friend Brian Church has an awesome story about how the term ambassador was first used in a term of representing someone else. You should hear it. It's very interesting. As we mentioned earlier in the book, You are your own personal brand. When you sincerely care about others around you more than you care about your own personal goals, you are very well on your way to developing the mindset needed to become a successful individual. You have a brand that people can genuinely believe in because you sincerely care about the relationships of those individuals that will get you to the promised land. Chapter 9. Be a Contributor. We all know individuals that complain about everything around them, and those same individuals will disagree with everything and everyone. These individuals love to complain about politics, politicians, and laws, but they won't do one thing to change how things are. 
As much as these individuals complain about how life is and how certain policies don't make any sense as to how things should be governed, you would think surely this individual has some say-so in changing the game, right? Wrong. This individual is just a beneficiary and not a contributor to changing anything. After speaking with this individual in more detail about their need to complain, you later find out they don't even vote. How often do you run into someone like this? This individual is what you would call a spectator, not wanting to get in the game, but would rather judge and complain on the sidelines. This individual doesn't want to commit to any action that could lead to change, but rather be a beneficiary of change if that change is to their advantage. Best-selling author Grant Cardone was speaking to a room of real estate agents back in 2013, and he said, spectators pay to watch, players get paid. Those words stuck with me when I heard them. Think about what he said for a moment and really let those words sink in. People that complain about everything in life but never contribute in the game of life always have something to say about the players that are in the game getting paid. As life starts to pass by year after year, the same people complaining start to look for someone else to blame for their misfortune. Let me encourage you to never be that person that always complain about the afflictions of life or how it's the wealthy or the system that's holding you back without doing something in life to try to change the things you see need to be changed. Those individuals are not considered to be contributors to society, but instead are known as beneficiaries to the outcome of what others made happen. Contributors set the standard and create the playing field that the beneficiaries have to live with. Contributors understand that attitude plays a critical role in becoming successful. They also understand that their mindset must be in a positive state and have an attitude that allows them to be a part of change and not sit back hoping and waiting for something good to fall into place. Be a part of the change you want to see. Chapter 10. Put your goals on paper. The evidence is absolutely overwhelming. You must have those goals. You cannot make it as a wandering generality. You must become a meaningful specific. Zig Ziglar. What do you want to be when you grow up? We have all heard this very broad but very profound question while in grade school. If you manage to make it through high school or what some people would call the trying times of adolescence, before graduating, teachers and friends would ask, what are you going to do now that you're graduating? Really think about that question. To be honest, there was one question I really didn't know the answer to. If we were to be completely honest with ourselves, a lot of us didn't know the true answer to that question when asked in grade school or in high school. Why is that? Of course, there are many factors that cause us to have a mindset of not knowing what is to come next. It can depend on your upbringing your knowledge of different career opportunities to pursue, the timing when a decision needs to be made to choose a career. It could simply be you don't know because you were a kid at the time when asked that question and you never thought about your life after graduation. Even as adults, we find ourselves asking that very same question. I believe all the above reasons are valid reasons why we didn't or don't know what we would like to be when we grow up. I also believe that the reason we do not know what we would like to be is because as a child, we never defined our goals and set them in motion to pursue before graduation day. We have all been guilty of what Zig Ziglar references to in the above quote. You cannot make it as a wonder generality. You must become a meaningful specific. When you have a goal in place, you are able to zero in on your desired target to pursue a particular goal. For example, on one of Zig Ziglar's recordings that speaks about having goals, he tells a story of a marksman by the name of Howard Hill. He goes into detail how Howard is a top-notch arch instructor, and within 20 minutes he could have anyone in the audience hitting the bullseye on a target better and more consistent than Howard Hill, provided that the individual had great eyesight and in good health. Of course, that was true only if he blindfolded and spun Howard Hill around so he couldn't know his target. You may be asking yourself, how can someone hit a target that they can't even see? And Zig Ziglar asked a more sobering question to the audience. How can you hit a target that you don't even have? 
I must say that stuck with me for days after hearing that message. I started to understand that there is more to doing something than simply just thinking about doing something. But when you begin to write things down, you are actually writing and committing your goals to memory. And when you begin to write your goals on paper, you are in a sense writing your goals in stone. You are in a sense stating it into law for yourself. When you are in sales, you begin to learn very quickly about the importance of having goals set for yourself. In sales, you will learn the meaning of you are only as good as your previous month or last sale. I am a firm believer in people continuously educating themselves, whether it's through reading books, magazines, newspapers, listening to talk radio, listening to inspirational videos, etc. With that being said, I discovered that when developing a mindset of successful thinking, you need to always be open to learning new things like an eager student. When you are eager to learn, you will begin to understand why you wanted to become successful in the first place. If you truly sit back and ask yourself the question, why I want to become successful, you may discover that you may not have a solid answer. This is why it is important to have goals. I believe that when you have goals, not only do you create a roadmap for yourself to accomplish your goals successfully, but you will also understand why you are working so hard to accomplish the goals you set for yourself. Simon Sinek, the author of Starting With Why, makes a great point in his book when he says, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. We often need to sell ourselves on why we do what we do and why we believe what we believe. And while we are in the process of developing a mindset of successful thinking, it would be very valuable to have goals in place. In order to achieve the goals you want to achieve, you must first set goals for yourself. In addition to setting and achieving goals, know why you want to become successful in the first place. Chapter 11. Stop thinking so much and pick one, a goal. Either put up or shut up, unknown. In the 2014 blockbuster movie Divergent, the main character, Treese, was standing on the edge of a tall building surrounded by her peers and future leadership. At that moment, Treese was looking at fear in his face, and she was expected to make a very critical decision in a very short period of time. I am sure as Treese was standing at the edge of the building with a slight wind at her back, she was probably wondering what the reason was behind the action that would lead to an unknown fate in her life as she looked down into a black hole. She did not know what was going to happen at the end of the very long fall. The only reason that Treese was standing on the edge of this building was because she was being initiated into a new way of living. This was something like a career change or a jump from a job where you are comfortable with a paycheck and now you are becoming an entrepreneur, living your dream. In order to move forward, she would need to make the required jump off the side of the building. I'm sure she second-guessed herself the entire time while standing at the edge. But she probably thought, what does she have to lose besides facing embarrassment to her peers and returning to the former way of living? A couple seconds go by and Trees jumps off the cliff, not knowing her fate at the end of the fall. As Trees falls through the large black hole, I'm sure she thought her body was going to go splat as she hits the ground. She falls into a net at the bottom of the fall and is greeted by the applause of other recruits. The reason for telling this story is that sometimes we just have to jump and stop second guessing ourselves when it comes to following our dreams while in the pursuit of success. Can you relate to the story above? Have you ever been at a crossroad in your life and needed to make a critical decision in order to move forward to achieve a set goal? Have you ever noticed that the longer you think about making a decision, the more you contemplate on not making a decision at all? Are you what people would call a serial entrepreneur with all your great ideas, but you're such a perfectionist that you never decide to move forward on any of your great ideas? Are you stuck in the idea phase because of fear and second-guessing your abilities? Well, that is the focus of this chapter, understanding the importance of choosing an idea regardless of the outcome. As you start to develop a mindset of successful thinking, you will discover that all lessons learned in life, whether good or bad, are beneficial in developing a better you. All you have to do 
to get the ball rolling and start the journey of a better you is to jump without any hesitation. You never know what could be at the end of the jump. Imagine yourself at the edge of a cliff that is as high as a 20-story building. Someone tells you there's a million dollars waiting on you at the bottom of your jump. When you jump, they tell you that you won't physically hurt yourself beyond maybe some scratches and bruises. Would you jump? Would you take that leap of faith if you were guaranteed a million dollar bag of money would be waiting on you at the bottom of the fall? Let's make things a little more realistic. What if someone told you that your idea has the potential to make you a millionaire? But all you need to do is to take it out of your head and put it on paper. Would that push you to jump towards the opportunity? Instead of moving forward on writing your plan out on paper, how much time does it take you to talk yourself out of moving forward on that million dollar idea? You talk yourself out of moving forward by asking yourself questions like, how am I going to pay for starting this idea? What if someone else has the same idea? What if I fail at getting started? And finally, I don't think I'm smart enough or knowledgeable enough in the field. Self-doubt is a weapon of destruction in your mind. What you would quickly discover is that no one has come out with your idea because you haven't made it known to the world yet. However, as time goes on, since you were dragging your feet, talking yourself out of claiming your million dollars, someone finally decided to create something similar to your idea and claim their million dollars. How many times have we seen this happen? Someone mentions a great idea and then years later, instead of saying, I did it, they say, that was my idea. Procrastination can cost you your million dollars. The mind is very fragile and sensitive to your thoughts. If you keep feeding yourself doubt and negative thoughts, your mind will believe and perform in the way you have trained it to. Your mind will become a creature of habit if you allow it. If you just tell your mind what it needs to do and the thoughts it needs to have towards your goals and ideas, it will begin to bring forth the positive energy needed to help you build your mindset of successful thinking. I want to encourage you to jump and put aside your doubts of achieving your goals to become a successful individual. Remember, in the beginning of the book, I told you of a friend that asked me how do I do it, how I can set my mind on something and get the results I want. Well, that's because I decide to just do things and pursue all my wishful ideas, big or small, and just go for it. I decided a long time ago to just try things and put my best effort into whatever I do at the time in hopes to reap a harvest at the end. What I discovered is that if I don't do it, someone else will. It does not matter if it is a career change you have contemplated or jumping into entrepreneurship. Whatever you desire to do, don't hesitate to jump. Since I was nine years old, I always known I was going to be successful. But I didn't know how I would get there. It's like I could see the big house, the wife and children, but I could never see the road that led me to the end results. I would come up with different ideas throughout the years expecting to one day be rich. But as time went on, I noticed that I started to slack and become complacent, making excuses as to why I wasn't moving forward with my ideas. But sure enough, I would complain about how people were coming up with the dumbest ideas and making millions of dollars just because he or she decided to move on their idea. From that point on, since I didn't know what ideas would get me to the promised land of success, I put all my ideas in motion and enjoyed the ride. I remember listening to a Les Brown audio tape and he mentioned people always ask him, how did you become so successful in life? He simply said, I don't have a clue how I got here. I just tried different things. I walked away knowing that Les Brown decided a long time ago that he was not going to allow fear to cloud his mind with doubt and the fear of failing. He was going to be successful by doing and not fearing. The good thing about failing is that you learn from your mistakes. Failure allows you to strengthen your faith in yourself and believe that success is yours to possess. So I ask you again, would you jump off the edge of the building that trees were standing on if someone told you that there was a million dollars at the end of the fall? Would you start that new business if you knew it would make you an instant millionaire? 
Would you start that new career if it allowed you to have more freedom and happiness in life? Would you take that leap of faith to do that something that would get you to that something you have always dreamed of? How would you ever know if you never jump? Trust yourself. Believe that you can do it and jump into your better you. Chapter 12. Procrastination isn't your friend. Birds of a feather flock together. Old proverb. There is an enemy out there that lurks in the minds of potentially great people. That enemy is procrastination. Procrastination can really stunt the growth of many potential million dollar ideas. Once procrastination seeps into the mind of an individual that is in the process of developing a mindset of successful thinking, the repercussions can be very fatal. What is the meaning of procrastination? Procrastination is simply intentionally putting off doing something that should be done sooner than later. There you have it. To put off intentionally the doing of something that should be done. How often have we done that? For me personally, I must admit, I procrastinated on writing this book for eight years. At one point in my writing journey, I started by writing at least one sentence or a paragraph a day that lasted for about a month. Every day I would say, I'll get to it tomorrow. And tomorrow would turn into a week. And a week to a month. And a month to eight freaking years. What was my excuse? There were no excuses. Procrastination had taken a hold of me. Procrastination will have you second guessing yourself so much that you will talk yourself out of pursuing your dreams in life. It starts out as a small voice in your mind that may ask you things like, are you sure you are qualified enough to do that job? Do you think he or she really likes you? Or it can even speak to you in a more encouraging voice telling you to just get some rest and start again tomorrow morning. You start to discover that after months of putting things off, you are still at square one with your goals. Procrastination would show up while in the process of writing this book and ask me, why are you writing this book? It would try to encourage me to leave it to the experts with the intent to get me to stop progressing forward with my writing. Yes, procrastination seems to have some valid points at times. And at times I did question myself. Questions like, what if no one reads this book? Or, there are plenty of books similar to this one. What makes this book different? Or, what if it never sells one copy? These questions clouded my mind during the beginning process of writing this book and caused self-doubt and procrastination to take over. But as I started to strengthen my way of thinking and truly apply the principles in this book, developing the mindset of successful thinking, I was able to avoid procrastination. The late great motivational speaker Zig Ziglar always said that everyone should write a book, even if it's never published because everyone has a story to tell. After I heard that saying for the first time, I was ready and equipped to fight procrastination even more. I decided to fix my mind to believe that as long as this book reaches one person and changes at least one life, then writing this book was all worth it. Regardless if I write a book that never sees the light of day, I can always say I defeated procrastination and achieved a lifelong goal because I finished what I started. We have discovered procrastination in the form of a small voice in your subconscious mind. But procrastination can also show up in a human form as well. Procrastination can come in the form of a family member, a friend, a co-worker, or even your spouse. Although they may have the best intentions at heart for you and think that they may actually be encouraging you by redirecting your mind to think you're wasting time, your dreams are ridiculous and will never come true. You have to continue moving forward with your goal and mission intact and not allow them to infect your mind with self-doubt, causing you to procrastinate on your dreams. When you continue to put important tasks on the back burner and so-called get to them later, idle tendencies begin to take over for progress. Take into consideration the goal that so many make to lose weight. You go to the doctor for a checkup, and on multiple occasions, the doctor has given you a Great report is every visit. However, he or she continues to remind you that you need to lose a few pounds. And I mean like 50 to 100 pounds. <laughs> In the past, you would hear the doctor tell you to lose weight, but 
you ignore the advice, but this time you decide to do something different and consider working out. You understand the importance of getting into shape and living a healthier lifestyle, so you decide to start fresh on Monday morning with a new workout routine. You are consistent for three full days, but all of a sudden, you begin to work longer hours at work, and you miss two days straight at the gym. Now, two days turn into two weeks missed at the gym, and two weeks turned into one month, but you tell yourself, I'll get back on it next Monday. A few next Mondays pass, and now it's been a year since you have been to the gym. Not only has it been a year since you've been back to the gym, but you have now gained 30 extra pounds, and it's time to go back to visit your doctor for your yearly checkup. The doctor does a normal checkup and run the usual test, but this time the reports are different. You're one point away from becoming a diabetic. It finally sinks in that you need to make a change in your life or you could be forced to lose weight due to an illness. This is a prime example of how procrastination comes to rob you of your destiny and leave you hopeless, all because you believe that if you didn't do it today, there will always be a tomorrow to start. There will always be a tomorrow for you to do a little bit more, but why not start today and beat the mindset of procrastination by simply starting? I want to tell you a little secret. We are not promised tomorrow, so you must live your life today and go after your dreams and accomplish your goals as if this is your last day on earth. I can tell you this story from experience because the above story was my story until I decided to change it. I was on the path of chronic illness. I told myself every excuse in the book why I didn't go to the gym today, why I could just go tomorrow, telling myself, it's okay if you miss today. You can just double up the workout tomorrow. Or, is it really worth going to the gym this morning while it's raining? I'll just go after it stops and just sleep in a little longer. I guess you can imagine. If I went to the gym the next day, I had an excuse not to do the extra or to miss the workout completely. So, of course, I didn't go. What's the situation? And how does this add to the most mindset of successful thinking? The question at this point is, how do you avoid procrastination? Or what are a few steps to defeat this common enemy? The answer is to simply do whatever you are giving yourself the excuse not to do. I noticed in my own life that if you just start doing whatever you want to accomplish when it's fresh on your mind, you would defeat the enemy called procrastination. Take, for example, if weight loss is one of your goals, don't say, I will start tomorrow or next week. Start working out right now. A few moments of work is better than none. You may surprise yourself. If you start, you may not want to stop, but instead keep going until your daily goals have been accomplished. If your goal is starting a business or writing a book, don't put it off until the time is so-called right. I'm going to let you in on the secret. There is no such thing as perfect timing to do anything. It's always after you decide to make a move to start that business or write that book that you will discover the perfect timing. Think about it. Because you started that business or started writing that book, you have now created a global empire because you started. The key word is you started the process at the right time. Nike has coined the saying, just do it. And that saying is true when it comes to encouraging yourself to just do it and overcome procrastination. If you just do it, you will find yourself in the top 1% of successful people because the other 99% is still waiting on the so-called right time, a.k.a. procrastinating on their dreams. Start being the best you today by setting goals and working daily to accomplish those goals. Don't allow procrastination to win. Instead, you decide to win and develop a mindset of successful thinking so you can get to a better you, so you can get to your success. Final thought. Now that we understand the meaning of success and that everything starts in the mind before it is developed in the natural, it is time to start putting your knowledge into action. The only reason why a person is successful in life is because he or she decided to become successful. You are one idea or one decision away from becoming a successful individual. You just need to make the decision to be successful. It's totally up to you. The only question remaining is what's holding you back from becoming the most successful person that this world has ever seen. 
You are the only person that can stand in your way. So move out of your own way and start eliminating self-doubt. Start eliminating the spirit of fear. Start eliminating procrastination. Eliminate the I can't mindset and replace it with the I can mindset. Know that you can. Believe that you can. Put your ideas into a plan and start accomplishing your goals today. You will become a success in no time with the right mindset and a plan that you can execute daily. So get up, get started, and get the most that life has for you. Remember, you deserve the very most out of life. It is up to you to make it happen. Now is the time. Success is waiting on